Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome everybody. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, one of two events uh, CSIS is, and the Shoal Chair is going to do to uh, uh, wrap up a, a lengthy project we've undertaken on uh, European Union digital trade regulation. Uh, uh, I'm going to introduce our principal author of, of the ten papers that we've produced on this subject, uh, Meredith Broadband, in just a minute, and she's going to present the uh, the most recent paper. And then we're going to have a conversation. Uh, this is, a, as I think everybody knows, a, a huge issue for a number of reasons. A digital trade in general has become a much more important part of the total global trade landscape. Uh, the U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Tai spoke about it yesterday uh, at, at Georgetown at, at, uh, at some length. And uh, the EU, I think, has become a prominent player in, in this issue. Uh, largely because it's discovered the, the merits of first mover advantage when it comes to regulation. And they are uh, spending a lot of time uh, in the regulatory space via the Digital Markets Act, which we'll be talking about today, but that's not the only thing. The Digital Services Act, uh, GDPR uh, in the past, and uh, regulations on artificial intelligence. So the EU is really setting the stage for... Um, substantial chunks of the world to decide whether they want to uh, follow down that path or, or take a different path. Um, I think, uh, personally, I, I, I think what we're discovering is that uh, uh, the DMA and, and the DSA are kind of uh, digital precautionary principles, which is an approach that the U.S. has not generally followed in, in its regulation. But uh, the reality is that the U.S. does not really have a policy, uh, a national policy in this space. And it's a, been a challenge for us to develop one, which will also, I think, be a topic of, topic of today's discussion. So it should be, uh, I, I don't think it'll be raucous. Uh, we're all polite, but it should be uh, interesting and I hope challenging. And I'll give everyone a heads up that this, will, this event today will be followed by one a week from tomorrow on November 12th, where we'll be talking about the larger picture of EU digital trade regulation and the American response, uh, and that will feature Peter Harrell from the uh, National Security Council, who, among other things, uh, holds uh, one of the, or one or more of the TTC, Trade Technology Council, um, subcommittee, uh, uh, committee chairs uh, on these subjects. So we're looking forward to having Peter next week. But today I'm going to turn it over to Meredith. Meredith Broadband is uh, our senior non-resident uh, fellow here at CSIS, and I said she's the principal author of, of most of the papers, which go back now 15 months that we've been put to cranking these things out. Several of them are, are longer papers, like the one we're going to be talking about today. A number of them are much shorter. You can see them all on our website, www.csis.org. Uh, Meredith is going to present the latest paper and introduce the panel that will be talking with her. We'll come back to me in... Uh, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes or so, and I'll uh, uh, monitor questions from the audience. So audience, if you have questions, put them in the chat uh, and we'll do our best to get to them. So Meredith, take it away. Thanks, Bill. Uh, really appreciate it. I wanna welcome our audience and, and particularly those that are joining from Europe. Um, we're anxious to have a discussion about some of the implications of the Digital Markets Act. Um, I want to introduce our panel first, and then I'll go into a short summary of our paper, and uh, then we'll do presentations from the panel. We're really lucky today to have Dr. Michael Mandel, who's Vice President and Chief Economist at the Progressive Policy Institute in Washington. He's also a senior fellow at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, and a fellow at, in, uh, at the Manufacturing Initiative at Indiana U University. He was chief economist at Business Week prior to it being purchased by Bloomberg. Tyson Barker is head of global affairs and technology at the uh, German Council on Foreign Relations, 
Previously, he had worked at the AS at Aspen Germany as deputy executive director and fellow, where uh, he was responsible for digital and transit the digital and transatlantic program. He's also served as a senior advisor at the Bureau for European and Eurasian Affairs at the State Department. And finally, our third pan panelist is Benedict Blomeyer. Uh, Mr. Blomeyer is an experienced small business and startup policy professional, and he currently serves as director of European Union policy at Allied for Startups in Europe, which is a network of over 40 adv advocacy organizations working to improve policy in Europe for startups. So that's our panel and we'll go to a discussion shortly. I just wanted to highlight uh, the most recent paper that the Schultz chair did on European Union technology policy. It's called Implications of the Digital Markets Act for Transatlantic Cooperation, which we published on September 15th. It's on our website. And in light of the launch of the US EU Trade and Technology Council and all the associated transatlantic promises of coordination and communication on tech regulation, we thought it was important to ask whether uh, USTR and the US government believe that their worker centric trade policy mean, means fighting for fair and non discriminatory treatment of US technology champions in Europe. I have to say that after reading Ambassador Tai's recent speech on digital trade policy, one would have to conclude that the administration is not currently there yet. They're, they're not viewing the fight for market access and fair treatment for American tech businesses and workers in Europe as their priority right now. Uh, Ambassador Tai pointed to a trust gap and she was questioning whether we have designed digital trade rules to meet the needs of ordinary people. I'm not sure whether she means the NAFTA digital trade rules, which I think were very state of the art and sound and what the plans are going forward. But this was a preliminary speech and she was laying out some of her thoughts. So I think it's, it's interesting to look at uh, the energy with which Europe is moving forward and a very heavy handed regulatory agenda. And our, our CSIS meeting announcement for this meeting really received some strong pushback from the European Commission. And they were saying that we were uh, it was unfair to criticize the Digital Markets Act as, as industrial protectionism that was aimed directly at five U.S. tech champions. And that would be Amazon, Google, and I guess the company formerly known as Facebook, um, Apple and Microsoft. Um, and we are open to be persuaded otherwise, but the statements by government officials and senior pol politicians in Europe, which have, we have outlined in our paper, are pretty clear in what Europe's intentions are with this huge heavy handed regulatory proposal. The European Commission introduced the Digital Markets Act on December 15th, 2020, and it was proposed a long time alongside the Digital Services Act. And the package is really targeted at reshaping business models with a long list of prohibitions and requirements in ways that would be that would look like they're going to impede market access of US tech giants. The Digital Markets Act is a landmark proposal of ex anti competition policy that will add to the European Union's existing legal structure for competition regulation, which is currently based is evidence based uh, organized case by case investigations. Many policymakers and the business and in the business community in the United States do see this as an attack on US companies for being too big and too successful in Europe. The European Commission, on the other hand, appears convinced that new ex ante, uh, the new ex ante regulatory structure under the DMA will create opportunities for US tech companies to scale and be more globally competitive. And the commission declares this, that this is what's gonna happen. In our view, we don't think that this is likely to occur. In a regulatory disabling of US tech giants, the DMA could, could really lead to a lot of perverse and unintended consequences for European businesses and consumers and, and for the strategic posture of Europe with respect to China, uh, whose companies will really go unscathed by this proposal. As outlined in our paper, European officials have championed the DMA as a tool for achieving technological sovereignty for, for the European Union. And we argue that these regulations should be scrutinized and then revised as necessary to ensure that they don't function as discriminatory, unmer uh, unfair measures of protectionism that could uh, really violate Europe's 
trade commitments at the WTO. Uh, the, the potential for fines on US companies is huge, up to about 10% of global revenues. So it, we have raised uh, a number of issues in our paper, uh, particularly some of the uh, data requirements and the uh, divulging of, of, of a lot of algorithms and intellectual property that's uh, really proprietary to US companies and are looking for input on uh, what some of the implications may be in the future uh, for this proposal as it moves forward. I wanted to, uh, with that, I wanted to turn to our panel. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Benedict Blomeyer currently um, whether he could just highlight what the status of the DMA is right now procedurally within the, within the European process for uh, approving, uh, approving legislation. Sure. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. It's good to be here. Um, I mean, we've all seen the commission put forward the proposal in last December. Where we're at right now is that the co-legislators, so the European Parliament and the Council representing the, the member states, of course, are in the process of making their own reports. In Parliament, the committees for opinion have made reports and now the lead committee, the Internal Market Committee, is working on its final version. This has been delayed because of disagreements with key provisions, but the vote is scheduled for late December and uh, late November, excuse me, and uh, then the plenary, uh, so all MEPs would have to vote in December. Um, in the council on the other side, um, you know, this is less, less, uh, less easy to, to see through because it's a bit less transparent, but we would anticipate a similar timeline. And if you're looking ahead now with the final versions from uh, commission, council and, and, and parliament, all three co-legislators um, come together to inter-institutional negotiations known as trilogues uh, to negotiate a common version. And, and, and this final version would then be voted upon by the parliament and by the council. Um, and then the DMA would be uh, done and dusted. And, and the, the planning was initially that this would occur in the first months of the French presidency in Q1 uh, next year. Um, overall, we're pretty far down the legislative pipeline already. Um, so, the, you know, I think the, accept, the understanding in Brussels is that the file is coming and now we're discussing details and amendments. Um, that's about where we're at. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, to me, it looks like it's moving quickly uh, and there really is not going to be uh, much input from the from the US government that I can see it's uh, there is a in the trade technology council, there is a, a, wor a, a working group on platforms. Um, but we haven't had a sense of, of what the U.S. government is communicating in terms of observations or communications on this regulation. And at the, at the rate it's moving, I'm not sure there, there'll be much opportunity to have any, any coordination on, on this technology regulation, even though the Trade and Technology Council is, is kind of aimed at encouraging that uh, based on all the statements that describe the Trade and Technology Council. Um, I wanted to uh, turn to uh, Michael Mandel to sort of uh, talk about uh, this industry and its importance for job creation in the U.S. and any observations he might have on the DMA. Well, one of the most important things about the uh, the um, the DMA is that it, it it's really aimed at one of the great U.S. job creating industries at this point. Historically, we haven't thought about tech and e-commerce as being a great source of jobs. But over the last few years, it's actually been the major source of job growth in the economy. We just have done a lot of research on this. And if you go to our website, I just put up a blog, a blog item on uh, tech as a creator of middle skill jobs. And I think that's really important here because when we think about the, the goal of US trade policy, the goal of US trade policy has to be in part to make sure that the U.S. is creating a new middle class based on, uh, you know, not just based on manufacturing, but based on sort of technology and e-commerce. And this is what we've actually seen over the last four years, we've seen 1.4 million jobs created in the tech e-commerce sector in, in, in the U.S. And it looks to me like the DMA would have the effect of slowing a lot of this job growth and actually undercutting the creation of a new middle class in the US. 
And that's really, that seems like, you know, from the point of view of the Democrats, that seems to be a, a bad idea. And so I'm a little bit sort of puzzled that the U.S. has not taken a stronger position against what looks like restrictive trade measures on one of the great job creating industries we have these days. Thank you, Michael. That's helpful. Um, Tyson, would you like to give a perspective on what's what's going on with respect to European business community and the, the German interest in this legislation? Sure. Uh, well, greetings everybody from, from Berlin and thank you so much for having me. Um, we are here in Berlin, right in the middle of coalition negotiations. So we're kind of somewhat in between governments, uh, getting ready for a new government to come into power, uh, headed by the Social Democrats, likely uh, with the Liberals and the Greens in the coalition. And I think that there is a degree of consensus within that um, emergent uh, coalition that the DMA and its, let's say, national um, adjacent piece of of new, uh, new instrument, uh, the 10th Amendment to uh, the cartel law in Germany are actually a good thing. Um, and one of the reasons has to do with something that you mentioned, but it's a different interpretation of the idea of digital sovereignty or technological sovereignty. So I, as an American, somewhat of an anthropologist sitting in, in, in Europe, I see and, and have a lot of sympathy for the view that digital sovereignty is another word for kind of dirigisme or protectionism. And that is certainly an interpretation of that in some corners of Brussels and some capitals, particularly in Paris. But here in Germany, I think it's a little bit more ordo liberal, the idea of digital sovereignty. Um, and I will just give a quick definition of what they say it is. It's, it's a market landscape that allows for competition and development of new business models independent from dominant players, access to trustworthy technology adhering to strong regulation, and a framework of conditions at the German and European level that allow for high standards of informational self-determination. That's a definition that was provided by Zygmunt Gabriel in 2015 when he was the economics minister. And I think that when you look at a whole range of regulatory and industrial policy initiatives coming out of Europe, be it in the cloud space, be it in the platform space, the data space, the AI space, uh, the semiconductor space, um, they're still working in a kind of strategic ambiguity between <laughs> something that can be interpreted as protectionist and something that's much more order liberal based on uh, creating a digital single market and creating greater space for competition. Um, but when I look at the DMA, and, and I think that this is the interpretation of most here, this is about uh, creating interoperability, about creating greater freedom to choose. Um, and that's part of the reason why it's not in a, a new competition tool, as was originally intended, but actually uh, draws on another, and this is very nerdy, but another piece of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union, which is actually lo looking to create a proper functioning of the internal market. Now, I do believe that there are questions about how that will work, specifically regarding the relationship between the DMA and national competition authorities. Uh, but if we're looking at the intention and we start from that intention, then I think there's, there's a lot of grounds for conversation with the United States and with tech players in the United States. Just one more point. Um, I think it's an excellent point to say that the US doesn't have a position. It has more of an affect um, and having the administration uh, kind of develop a more thought through and consistent position, I think would, would greatly strengthen this discourse. Thanks. Thank you, Tyson, appreciate that. Um, Benedict, from a lot of this, uh, the rhetoric surrounding the DMA goes to creating uh, room in the market for innovation and, and startups and so forth. Um, how, how are your members seeing, seeing the, the proposal so far? So uh, for those who didn't catch it at the start, I represent a business organization representing 45 startup organizations. And um, there's pretty diverse views on this actually. Of course, um, um, and maybe let me start by explaining it like this. Um, you know, the, the DMA targets gatekeepers with prohibitions and obligations. And our members aren't yet in the scope of the DMA. Some may wanna become big. But of course, um, you know, we've seen that startups have become customers, complements, and competitors. 
of the big gatekeepers. You'll find plenty of examples for all of these. I think one of the issues we have is that you know we we see this group group think that we can just target some big players and you know they're you know and then you know a thousand flowers will 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 you know will follow. Uh, that's not that's not uh, really kind of what we see um, what, or what we believe. So our our feeling is that um, there's a lot of interdependencies that we uh, don't fully take into account uh, when with the DMA at this point. You know, a, a local a social impact startup fighting food waste is built on an existing map. A local SME you know employs existing payment solutions. Um, so there are a lot of interdependencies that uh, you know we probably uh, we don't understand fully yet. Now, that isn't to say um, that we think the DMA is bad per se. Our, our association thinks that the DMA overall can be a, a success. We should focus on where there is proven uh, unfair or anti-competitive behavior and, and, and consumer harm and, 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 and uh, focus there. Um, but with this kind of broadside uh, list of prohibitions and obligations the way we have it right now, we feel we're kind of getting a lot of unintended and negative consequences. Thank you. Tyson, could you talk a little bit more about enforcement of the DMA and how, how the authorities will be split between the commission and member states as they're current, currently conceiving it? Well, it's very much a live topic, <laughs> like, like pretty much all these things. And, and even the question of, you know, uh, uh, yeah, core platform services. Uh, some of the ones just mentioned are not considered core platform services, for example, payment systems. Um, but it's definitely something to, worth talking about. Um, one, uh, a couple of aspects that are currently in the, in the mix. Um, there is the idea that uh, member states should still be able to produce, pursue um, action in their legitimate interests. Um, and if there are stricter uh, requirements that they should be able to pursue them as long as they're um, communicating with the commission, the proper commission authorities. And that has been something that has been uh, pushed specifically by Germany because they have just gone through a major reform of their uh, cartel pro um, investigation process. Um, the commission itself is looking to beef up its um, unit dealing with uh, DMA enforcement. Uh, with about 80 people uh, just looking at designations and obligations under, uh, you know, what would constitute a gatekeeper and to start that discourse with those gatekeepers about, you know, what are the, the do's and what are the don'ts under articles uh, five and six. Um, but that's an interesting part of the kind of philosophy of this regulation, and it's similar to the DSA, that this isn't meant to be a static uh, regulation that comes into place or a static law that comes into place, and that's that. That this is going to become a regulatory ecosystem, if you will, um, that there's going to be dynamics that are going to be con continuously developing. Um, and I think that, that is, that's kind of unique, and that's addressing a deficiency in uh, competition law right now, which I think everybody acknowledges is frankly just too slow to deal with the development of technology as we're seeing it today. Great, thank you. Um, and the and I know the U.S. of course is regulate is, is wrestling with some of the the same competition policy issues. Um, and we've got legislation moving through the Judiciary Committee, although I think it's kind of stopped uh, for, a, for a pause uh, to get some more input from, from the U.S. companies that will be affected. Um, the, uh, in terms of using the Trade and Technology Council as an opportunity to work out uh, some of the best ways to achieve you know, regulatory goals of, of uh uh, competition policy. Do you all see the Trade and Technology Council as an active venue to discuss some of these common concerns about uh, big tech platforms? Benedict, do you want to take that? Happy to go go, go first quickly. Um, I, I, you know, Tyson also mentioned the discussion about sovereignty. I think, if you know, with that in mind, I think it's obviously very sensitive politically to kind of. Uh, you know, make I give ideas or suggestions as to how Europeans should uh, frame their Digital Markets Act. Um, so I do think it's sensitive, one. And secondly, I think the DMA is very far down the legislative 
uh, timetable already, I don't see anything coming out of the TTC in time that can really turn around, uh, uh, you know, make a ma massive impact on the, on the DMA. I would say that um, for future legislation, this is an opportunity to coordinate better. So we look a lot at the Data Act as well, uh, which has been talked about as the you know, future GDPR of, uh, of non-personal data. And here it would appear that we have a chance in the TTC to coordinate this more closely in the future. Let me add something here, which is that, which is that Tyson mentioned that it was important for the US to have to come to this, to have a develop a position, okay, about what we want out of digital trade and digital trade policy. And I think you it, the, the, the council is not gonna have an impact unless the US can do this. And I, and I would actually sort of argue at this point is that, is that if, if, if Europe is talking about digital sovereignty, it would be interesting to think about whether or not the US started talking about digital sovereignty as well and what impact that would have. Okay, and I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that Europe would be very happy about that. Okay, and um, I do think, I mean, I, what I've been looking at a lot at is the whole question about what a global economy really means in a digital world. And does digital sovereignty actually make any sense when you've got a global economy? What does it, what, what, are, we, what are we actually talking about? And I think that we need to, I mean, maybe the TTC is the right place to take a step back and think about these larger questions of, of philosophy. You know, if you have a global economy, are you really trying to sort of, sort of draw boundary lines between what's, what's a US company and what's a European company and actually think of trying to, I mean, when I hear the word digital sovereignty, it's actually a little bit kind of confusing to me. Okay, I don't know what it means in the end. Does it actually mean in the end, does it actually come, you know, you, does it come close to protectionism? Okay, in practice, I understand what you were saying in terms of philosophy, but what does it mean? What does it actually mean in practice? If, if, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to respond to that as well on the TTC and perhaps also on digital sovereignty. On, on the TTC, I mean, uh, you know, the commission's line, and I think that it's kind of what Benedict said, is that we're talking about legislation that is now in a live negotiation between uh, the three branches of the European Union, essentially, and that that is a difficult uh, uh, piece for, for the commission to talk about bilaterally with the United States now that it's actually in the European Parliament that's that's drafting its amendments to the to the legislation. Um, of course, the US can still have an impact. Um, even right now, there are discussions about the scope of what would constitute gatekeepers. And I think that that is a really valid area for the US to engage because there is, as I think has been, the, the feeling is very strong that there could be and are perhaps could be discriminatory tendencies here. Clearly that's that's evidenced in the rhetoric. But as as Americans here, you know, sometimes having lived through four years of the Trump administration, we have to say, you know, sometimes you have to, although the rhetoric and the policy can be related, you have to make sure that there is some distinction between the two. So when Macron says, for example, you know, we, we want a European way, we don't want to have a Silicon Valley internet or a Chinese internet, or we hear some MEPs actually names very specific companies uh, in the scope of the DMA, that is the rhetoric piece. <laughs> it's not necessarily the law piece. So rather than getting spun up over the rhetoric, let's focus on, on the legislation. On the TTC itself, uh, the fifth working group that deals with uh, data governments, governance and platforms, I think it's exactly right what uh, Benedict said. I wish the TTC would have existed I, a year ago, <laughs> because I think that that would have been much more timely to uh, accompany this process. And we have a vehicle now for doing something on the data act and industrial data and cloud rules, which I think we're, we're really, really well positioned to, to influence. I will say that an early draft of the TTC joint statement, um, which was not the final draft, but I have a, a quote from it here, actually explicitly mentioned gatekeepers. Um, that was cut. I don't know which side cut it or which actor cut it. I, I have my thoughts. Um, but at least there was some consideration of whether or not this should actually be included in the joint statement itself. I don't know if uh, any administration document has included the term gatekeepers yet. And of course, I don't know if there's a, even consideration of a definition of what that should be. But clearly, there's some degree of convergence here. It may, it may very well be, it may very well be that 
that the U.S. needs to think more about what a, what a worker-centric trade policy would look like here for the U.S., okay? To what extent are we actually trying to sort of, is the U.S. actually concerned about the development of, you know, sort of fostering the development of middle skill jobs in the, in the U.S., which is extremely important, and relating that to sort of digital trade policy, which is, and, you know, we've reached kind of a crucial moment at this point because, in fact, there is a, I mean, I always love using this word, a burgeoning middle class in the U.S. that is driven by tech and e-commerce that was not here before. And it would be a shame if, if the developments on the tr digital trade front or on the DMA would actually get in the way of that. Michael, um, could you talk a little bit just about the numbers of job creation for, for the, in the high tech sector versus uh, the regular economy overall in the well, U.S.? Yeah, so I mean, the, the term that I use is tech e-commerce because it sort of covers it covers the 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 the, the major five companies, but it also covers the whole ecosystem of technology and e-commerce in the U.S. And over the last four years, 2017 to sort of 2021, there's 1.4 million jobs created in the tech e-commerce sector in the U.S. And compared to say 500,000 in health and uh, healthcare, which was the previous major job creator, and the the big difference is that is that healthcare was not uh, was as a regulated regulated and sort of productivity stagnant sector was not actually creating a lot of middle skill well paid middle skill jobs. So this is we really have reached this really interesting key moment in in the political economy of the U.S. where so much of the debate, okay, the very intense debate between the between the left and the right between the Republicans and the Democrats is about is, is about the creation of these middle skill jobs sort of across the country and they are being created and they are being created by, by both large and small companies. And why we would want this momentum to be broken, okay, and this is actually true in, 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 in Europe as well, why we would try to fix something which is not broken from the job side we may actually sort of, the, the analogy that I like to use is that, is that people are looking at this fast moving car and saying, well, we could take some parts out of the engine and it's still gonna run, but that's, that's very, that's full of hubris, okay? About what we know about the economy. We've got something that's, we've got something that's functioning really well for workers at this point and functioning really well for consumers. And it's not quite clear why we want to take parts out of the engine. Can I just jump in for a second? Sure. Just very quickly, because you know the, the jobs numbers uh, coming from tech, from startups in Europe are, are similarly impressive. Startups are hiring three times more than other economic sectors here as well. We've seen you know, the startup ecosystem in Europe go from record year to record year and investments as well are going from record year to record year. And we've shared the feedback uh, as well with policymakers here, that the system isn't fundamentally broken, even if we want to you know, fine tune it. Um, but I do think, you know, uh, Michael is absolutely spot on in, in when he suggests that we should maybe be focusing a bit more on the jobs angle and the business angle, and a bit more on also an argument I think we've lost, so to speak, the consumer angle, uh, because this is also being shared as a kind of clearly having consumer, the DMA is for consumers as well. And, you know, from coming from the perspective of startups, where we kind of like to think of ourselves as the closest companies to, uh, to consumers ever, um, it feels a bit, some of this feel, feels a bit, um, yeah, paradox. Um, so maybe, you know, obviously there's a big trade discussion happening as well, but I wonder if, you know, saying, you know, you're targeting US uh, companies and, you know, the Chinese ones are getting a free pass might be a less effective argument than looking at, you know, talking to some of the member states about, businesses and consumer uh, harm. This is what's really interesting about this whole discussion, not just in Europe, but in the US, which is that if you believe that, that, that middle skill jobs are the objective for everybody, this is working at this point. And it's working in a, it's working in a broad sense that, that that was really terrific facts you sort of brought to the table, Benedict, okay, about, about the, startup, the startup job growth. And I think that um, uh, you know, if you sort of ask, sort of, what, what is the term self goal? Okay, this runs the risk of being a, you know, you know, us not, you know, 
policymakers knocking the knocking knocking the ball back into our own goal at this point. If, if you don't mind, um, I, just to jump in on some of the the points that have been made, because I think it's it's excellent to talk about consumer welfare, which is really important and one of the intended goals of the DMA, uh, and innovation uh, and job creation, which is obviously a number one priority for all policymakers, uh, economic policymakers, except good paying jobs, good jobs. Um, but you know, the DMA is not looking to break up companies. Um, it is looking to create a new relationship with regulators. It is looking to provide more choice. It is looking to unlock lock-in effects. It is looking to uh, you know, limit uh, self-preferencing in these gatekeepers. Um, if you look at what it's actually trying to do, I think consumers would actually be quite interested in this. And so would a lot of smaller actors. Now, of course, we have a representative from Allied for Startups. So, and I know that there's a plurality of views <laughs> within that community, um, but we have a lot of high profile cases like uh, the Apple Epic case right now in the United States, where we see a lot of, you know, conflicting objectives and points of view. And all this is trying to do is tilt uh, the power dynamic in the uh, direction of more dynamic uh, regulation that is controlled by democratically um, accountable uh, bodies. That's that's what this is trying to do. And I think that the more we focus on that aspect and get U.S. policymakers involved in this discussion, I think that the better we will be, both in Brussels and in national capitals like Berlin. Do you all see the... Um, uh, if it looks like the US is not gonna be able to pass any sort of digital legislation in the near future. And uh, so we seem to be uh, going down a path where Europe will be setting more of the rules in this sector. Um, do you see this being concerned that, that the DMA will become the default position if the United States doesn't produce an alternative piece of legislation? Well, I, I mean, I, I, go ahead, go, please. Sorry, go, no, go, go, go ahead, Tyson. I just, just one quick point. I mean, I think that, you know, there's this famous uh, concept, the Brussels effect, uh, the, this book that was written about, you know, the extraterritorial impact of the European Union and its regulatory power. But what, what people sometimes miss is the, the instinct of Brussels is actually to work in concert with like-minded partners. And that a lot of regulation that comes as a, as a product of what they call contingent unilateralism. So if nobody else's work is going in this direction, they're going to go there. And, and the commission has been signaling that it's going to do something in platform the platform space, both in the market power of online platforms and in uh, the question of content, uh, content moderation, since I think 2013. Um, so this has been a long time coming. There was a long time to engage in this discussion. Um, and perhaps we should have been more engaged. Now we're seeing the results of that. It happened with GDPR as well. Um, the one thing that we should say is obviously Europeans have to be honest about trade-offs with their citizens. Um, GDPR, there's a first mover advantage and there's a first mover disadvantage, right? I think, I think a lot of people would acknowledge that. Um, but, that but the way that GDPR is perceived in Europe is as a success. And I think that that is part of the, the lesson that is fueling this process and its, and its timetable. Can I ask you a question what the definition of success is there? Okay, you know, if part, if, see what I would consider to be a success at this point, I mean, part of what the GDPR was sort of built at it is that it would, it would make consumers feel better about their data and technology and it would cause an increase in growth, right? What I see is, is, is a continual stream of legislation, right? That it, it wasn't a GDPR, then you get the DMA, you get other, you know, more legislation as well. You know, I, I think what, what's really interesting here, and, I, and I, sort of, I, I sort of mentioned this before, what does regulation look like in the global economy? Okay, what can we agree to? How do you sort of actually allow national digital sovereignty at the same time, you have a global economy. What are you trying to accomplish there? I think there's a lot of unclarity in that. Now, when we when we look back 
at what our what our goals are. I think we sort of have to be more specific. Is our goals economic, jobs, right? Um, or is it or is it are, are there is sovereignty an important goal as well? Because that's not the that's not what we mean by a global economy. Um, on, on sovereignty, I, again, I'm taking the ordo liberal kind of definition that I think that the German Berlin consensus is more based on, which is freedom to choose, um, you know, to avoid cartels, to avoid monopolies, uh, to create freedom to choose. And sovereignty, what is the sovereign unit? What well, could be the individual? So if you don't think of the sovereign, the, the sovereign I, I, I don't know. as I don't being, know. And, and, I mean, sorry, this is very philosophical, but this is actually a, a big part of the political debate here in, in Europe is just the term sovereignty. What's sovereign? Is it the nation? Is it uh, the power, the European Union? Is it uh, the company or is it the individual? And the truth is, is it's all of it. Um, but if you take something like GDPR, GDPR, at least in the European sense, was a codification of the idea of in informational self-determination, which is a fundamental right. So that's different. That's different. That's different than the way that the DMA is being built. Okay, we're not. The, the, you know, it's the. You look at it, and you're, you're not seeing fundamental rights there. You're sort of seeing economic arguments, which have a different flavor to them. Especially when applied to the word, especially when applied to the word sovereignty, um, I, I what it looks a little bit to me like is a is a is a is a is a backdoor negotiation on what's going on and what 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 you know where the rules are being set, and so you know I, I would like to see kind of a clearer view of what a good outcome would be for Europe and what a good outcome would be for the US from an economic perspective. So we could sort of actually assess whether or not this was gonna work this way. Um, Benedict, do you, um, what is your sense on uh, the impact of this legislation on Chinese firms in Europe? Uh, we sort of have a different approach on uh, digital practices and if we're, hampering the ability of, of US companies to compete in Europe, what will be happening to the Chinese competition there, Alibaba and so forth? Will they, are they at risk at all by the, by the DMA proposal? I mean, that's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to respond to. I will say that, that of course the DMA has you know, qualitative and quantitative thresholds. So well, at one point, uh, you know, if the, the Chinese companies become that successful, they too will fall in the scope of the DMA. At the same time, you know, the U.S. companies are not targeted because they're U.S. Uh, that would be an open and shut case in front of international trade bodies. They are targeted because they are already successful. Um, you know, thresholds based on size. What this will do with the growth prospects um, of these uh, firms, I, I'm cannot really give a serious, uh, a good projection um, um, on that. Tyson, do you have any sense on how Chinese firms operating in Europe will be affected? I mean, I've, I've seen a couple of different um, analyses of the different thresholds that have been marked. And again, that's a moving target, but uh, there have been some that just target the five, <laughs> which we've been mentioning. There are some that have a broader scope, uh, which uh, I've, I've heard, I don't, I hate to say this, but I've heard, you know, MEP say, well, it needs to include Airbnb and booking, you know, which would not be included in the fourth criteria that's now under dis dis uh, discussion about, um, you need to have two, more than two or two or more um, uh, core platform services involved in that formulation. Um, the truth is, is it's unlikely that Chinese companies would currently fall under the DMA as, as, as it is interpreted either by dance or Ali. Um, and it is, it is an issue. I mean, I think there, again, this debate started in 2014, 2013, 2014. And it needs to be making sure that it reflects the world as it is today and the world that it's going to be governing in the future, because this is a kind of once in generation piece of legislation, just like the AI Act and, and DSA, and uh, needs to anticipate future trends. And I think that they're trying to do that. But even if you look at enforcement action in uh, 
data protection authorities. Um, they have been overwhelmingly focused on US companies. I think that's obvious. Um, and they could be much more focused on the sloppy behavior of a company like TikTok. Um, they're starting, but it's it, there is a lag. Um, one thing I think would be interesting, and I'm not the guy to do it, I haven't done any kind of uh, examination, is to think about what China is doing in the, the antitrust space as well. Because China is also, I know that there's different intentions here. Maybe Michael has some perspective on this. I see him reacting. <laughs> well, you know what I'm I mean? Yeah, I think that I think I think that's an important point, and I would actually consider that a mark against this sort of action. Okay, that that what China is doing is is it's is it's um, it's it's it is bringing the tech companies under under authoritarian rule at this point, political rule, and that seems to me to be exactly the way that we would not want to go. And but the you know the the, the Chinese question really raises a larger point, which is. Which is sort of which is shared values, okay. And the question is whether or not the U.S. and Europe has have have deeper shared values than they do with China, and that's what that's what seems to be missing from the discussion at this point. And I'm perhaps not the best person to address it. I mean, I view the Chinese model as authoritarian capitalism, and if you can make authoritarian, I mean, my view is that if if authoritarian capitalism turns out to be you know, successful as an innovation model that everybody's going to adopt it and that's not a good thing. Um, I mean, I would prefer to sort of stick with some version of democratic democratic capitalism, which both the US and Europe have. And, and the big tech companies in the US have arisen under, under a democratic system that would seem to sort of share more values with Europe than, um, than the Chinese companies. Okay, Bill, would you like to, to take it from here? Yes, thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Meredith, and thank you to the panelists for uh, really a good discussion. You know, obviously, we have three experts uh, here, uh, which is, uh, makes for a great discussion. We do have some questions from the audience, which I think are thoughtful questions, <clears throat> and I'll uh, try to put some, some of them to you in the, in the remaining time. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, this is for anybody, but it refers to something that Benedict said. Uh, the deliberations on DMA, according to Benedict, are far advanced and final legislation might be expected by the end of Q1 2022. A member of the commission's DG uh, FISMA, FISMA, recently voiced an estimate according to which DMA's legislation would not materialize before 2023. That would leave more time for cross-Atlantic compromise, compromise, would it not? So I guess there's two questions there. Who's right? Uh, and second, uh, if you've got an additional year, would it permit more time for cross-Atlantic compromise? Benedict, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I think both can be right. It's politics. So uh, no guarantees on timetables, of course. You know, the e-privacy directive was supposed to pass with the, with the GDPR in 2016, and it's still stuck in the council somewhere. So, you know, we're kind of, you know, there's a bit of wait and see. Um, I would say that on the DMA, as Tyson alluded to, there's broad political consensus across Europe that this is kind of good and it's coming. So I would, you know, there might be some delays because there are uh, kind of provisions that have to be ironed out, but I would say this is coming relatively quickly. Um, that doesn't mean that the entry into force is coming, you know, very quickly because you have to, you know, once it's adopted, um, you know, then member states still need to pass it into their own uh, law. And it's a regulation, they have to do that one to one. And um, so some might also have to change their competition rules accordingly. So this can always take a bit of time. There's usually a year or two given to do this. And then after the um, implementation, there's usually one more year or so before entry into force. And um, so, you know, that mean, means we might be actually looking at 22, 23. But that being said, um, the DMA in, is, has unusually short timelines it proposes here. Um, um, I, I can't remember the numbers exactly. But I would, you know, I would bet uh, um, my, my Belgian beer that there will be litigation right after the DMA is passed, especially by big, bigger companies, um, which might be classified as gatekeepers, simply to win some time, because some of these changes will have to be very, you know, very much cutting into business models. So I also anticipate litigation. Um, yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Just, just for context, real quick, it took it, it the the GDPR took from introduction to coming into force was six years. What what is amazing about the DMA is that it's it's going to force changes in business models for major companies. Okay, and this is really unprecedented. And so I think that I think that at, you know the way that I view this is that the the best way to sort of slow this down is actually for the U.S. to become more engaged in the process. All right, and this will not slow it down from the perspective of it going through the European process, but from the point of being in, engaged as a trade policy, as 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 industrial policy, as national so as, as digital sovereignty policy. You know, it's something that has to be done on the 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 country to country level. Okay, let's go on to the next one, which is with our beginning to accumulate. The European Union, with the exception of Spotify, has lagged behind the US in producing successful technology giants. A 2016 working paper from the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco cites European labor laws as a major factor for this. Inflexibilities in the labor market caused by these laws has limited the ability of firms to reorganize in order to benefit from IT. Is the DMA part of a multi-pronged approach that includes regulatory reform in the EU to jumpstart its tech sector? Benedict, you're shaking your head. Do you want to? Uh, so, so I would say yes, kind of. But I would also try to not paint quite as a gloomy picture. I mentioned some of the stats before about you know, the potential of European tech. Uh, one more stat I would mention is from DealRoom, which is a big you know, data, collects a lot of data on, on EU startups. And basically, they you know, put EU startups and EU tech investment in a, on, a, on a trajectory, excuse me. And they, were, they found that EU, um, EU, um, um, the EU growth rate of EU ecosystems is about the same as the US was 10 years ago. It's just 10 years late. So the word lagged is actually pretty good. Um, so the question is how we can also get the most out of the potential we have right now. Okay, let's move on to the next one then. Uh, th these are really interesting questions. Tech firms, meaning broadly, not just the targeted firms or the apparently targeted firms in the US are already concerned that the antitrust the competition efforts in Congress will chill investment, innovation, and job growth here. Are there similar concerns within the European technology industry in anticipation of the DMA? The answer, and I'm sure everybody would say this, of course, there, there are people making this case, uh, as is always the case in any form of regulation. Um, but I think if we look at areas like Germany in manufacturing and automobiles and appliances or California in tech, sometimes the uh, leading regulating uh, uh, states or, or governments are also home to some of the most advanced companies. So they aren't necessarily in opposition. But uh, as a stakeholder, businesses are always wanting more freedom. Uh, they want to be as, as, as unencumbered as possible by regulation. So, of course. Anybody else want to step in on that? Michael? I, I don't think that, uh, I, you know, if from, the, from the European point of view, if part of the point is sort of digital sovereignty, I think they th that Europe thinks of this as partly job creating in Europe. I'm not sure this, that, that this is right. It really depends on the willingness to, uh, to step up with investment. And, um, and we don't really see that yet. Um, I think that uh, this, this, uh, the, this question is, is related to the, to the whole question of, are, they, are European companies worried they're gonna sort of grow and be sort of hit by the gatekeeper regulations or are they sort of finally enough to find that they're going to sort of, uh, you know, stick to the U.S. companies. What's the answer to that? Are they going to stick to the U.S. companies? Well, these are these are you, you know you look at the you look at the regulations as they stand and they're, you know, unlike unlike the uh, unlike the OECD tax policy uh, proposals which were designed to sort of be broader, right? And so you know, had negotiations for that, so they were not simply about the, the digital giants, okay? Uh, these regulations um, 
may actually, you know, look like that in practice, they're very narrowly focused. And so uh, I think that's a really important point. One difference, of course, is the OECD negotiations involved a lot of parties that were not in the EU. I think I think that's and, I think that I think that's important. Yeah, uh, Benedict, our our um, our investors stepping up far less than we thought they would, and you actually raise a really important point, which is what does this uh, DMA do with the M and A and acquisition landscape for startups in Europe? Because you know, if we're effectively saying that if you have a core service in one area, um, you know, and it's going to be hard for you to bundle data or to be successful in another area, we are kind of setting the pathway for a lot of uh, you know vertically successful European champions, but not really many horizontal champions. And of course, often when you know um, um, startups are often acquired by big companies when they try to go into a new area. And we know uh, from experience that this is good for the ecosystems. You know, in talent, knowledge, and capital are injected back. Uh, think of the Estonian mafia following Skype or the Critio mafia in, in France. This is part of the EU small but rising startup success story. Now, we are rather concerned that the DMA might undercut acquisitions um, accidentally um, or sort of deliberately uh, with some of the provisions. Um, and. Astonishingly, not very many investors have been uh, uh, active in, in the discussion uh, about this yet. The, the DMA is biased against scale and scope companies. Okay, it wants, as you say, Benedict, it wants narrowly focused companies. And the narrowly focused companies may not be capable of conducting R&D on the same level as scale and scope companies. And, and this includes the great European companies as well. When you sort of talk about, when you talk about the, auto, the, the, the automakers, Tyson, okay. These are companies that actually have a, you know, or the industrial companies like Siemens has a, have a lot of scale and scope to them. I'm not saying that they're gonna be hit by the DMA, but this is partly how you get heft by, by, by operating across different areas. I That's don't know cool. if they have the. I I guess they they might have the market capitalization. I don't know. We'd we'd have the to market. Look. I mean, obviously I, they don't they, they don't yet have the uh the, the core platform functions that would be well. Would, but, but you're sort of defining the core platform functions. I'm not sort of saying that that Siemens would be hit by the DMA. What I'm thinking though is that is that companies that are in, operate in several different areas in a major way, have historically been ones that have a lot of the R and D scale and and R and D scale and heft to sort of do technological development at the cutting edge. And the DMA basically is saying we'd rather have small, narrower companies that in order to stay I away think, from- I think what, what the DMA is saying, not that I, I speak for the DMA, is that it wants more <laughs> dynamism in the market. Um, you know, there is a sense that that by definition, gatekeepers are, are massive intermediaries with, with uh, dominance uh, you know, market dominance in their spaces and perhaps across lines of service. Uh, and so they want to make sure that there's dynamism there that companies can grow. I, I, the, the merger uh, and acquisition uh, component, I believe, just requires consultation with the commission. Um, perhaps, you, Benedict, do you want to speak to that? I mean, it might change the definition of a company, but I, I do believe that there is still scope for, for mergers and acquisitions. Well, we have to let me uh, squeeze in one more here that relates to something that we were just talking about. Is there an opportunity to encourage financing for startups in the transatlantic context through our dialogues? I'm not right sure how that one fits in just yet. Um, to maybe just quickly to 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 Tyson's point, you're absolutely right. Of course, acquisitions are not made illegal. Uh, and there is formally only a, a communication requirement because this is not only a, a, a harmonization law, not a competition law. They can't do more than that. But of course, some of the prohibitions and obligations will make it less likely that uh, big platforms will uh, also compete against each other by acquiring a startup. You know, how many of you use this uh, clubhouse, you know, half a year or a year ago? And, and, you know, maybe if this was acquired by one of the competitors of a big, you know, social media company formerly known as Facebook, um, maybe it would have a long, you know, a different chance or you know, a different standing in the in the market. No, it's an it's an open question. And I would say that the combination with the changes in the merger regulation happening in in in, in Brussels at the same time do leave open questions as to you know where the European Union is going overall in mergers. 
Well, we've reached the end game. There's one remaining question, which is not a question. It's a comment. Uh, and I'll throw it out there and uh, not ask you to react because we don't have time, but it gives you a flavor of, of the mood, which is uh, the, this, the comment is, you say economic regulatory system, we hear European extortion racket. So you can take that any way you want. Uh, I'll turn it over to Meredith for a final comment. And thanks in particular to the panelists uh, for a very thoughtful discussion. Meredith, you get the last word. Yeah, no, great discussion. I, I think it, it the, the issues really beg for more uh, discussion between the U.S. and the Europeans, and I and I hope the Trade and Technology Council will be able to grapple with some of these things before the law becomes permanent uh, in Europe. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences for innovation in Europe and and uh, things that we're we're not anticipating with all of this this regulation. So it's it's a good time for more discussion, more exchange, and and forward to working on it further. And if you want to hear what the United States is going to do about it, join us next Friday afternoon, I think at one o'clock, uh, for Peter Harrell, who hopefully will tell us what the answer to that question is. Or and not. he's the guy. Or find out. He's, Pardon he's, me? He's, he's the guy. He's chairing the, the working group dealing with this. He is. That's why we're having him. I hope he'll have something to say. Um, he always has something to say. Whether it's something new <laughs> remains to be seen. Uh, but we'll find out next uh, Friday, so tune in. Meanwhile, thanks to the panel, and thanks to all of you for joining us. I hope to see you again. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you.